rockets to rooms. Blast off with SpaceX's plan to build the first moon base from rockets. Have you ever dreamt of living on the moon? That's the crazy idea behind SpaceX's plan to build the first moon base. Forget inflatable bouncy castles, they're turning their Starship rockets into lunar digs. Buckle up, space explorers, because we're about to explore the mind-blowing process of transforming a spaceship into a permanent home. This is a huge endeavor that will call for the energy-efficient engines and minimalist designs that have made SpaceX and Tesla well-known. A real application of first principles. The simple solution to the issue is that SpaceX already has a massive Starship under construction that will land on the moon and sustain an astronaut crew for several days, so they don't need to construct a lunar base. The car itself is essentially built to function as a mobile residence or as a portable moon base at one point. Let's take a closer look at our lunar lander Starship and attempt to figure out what's going on inside before we build what amounts to the lunar equivalent of a caravan park by converting these mobile rockets into permanent dwellings. In comparison to the Starships of today, ours appears substantially different from the exterior. Instead of displaying raw stainless steel, the lunar Starship is always depicted in white paint. We also notice that these lunar ships lack wings and heat shield tiles, which I assume is more a marketing decision than anything else. This is because the lunar ships are meant to stay on or near the moon indefinitely, not return to Earth. This leads us to believe that they might as well be converted into something useful, rather than just giant space junk. A peculiarity of the Starship design is that, although it will have a very high ceiling, only the uppermost third of it will be functional for the crew and cargo during the Artemis mission. Before the Starship departs for its journey to the lunar surface, the remaining portion of its body consists of fuel tanks, which will be replenished while in orbit around the Earth. Those fuel tanks ought to be nearly empty once more, after speeding into a translunar injection, slowing down to enter the Moon's orbit, and then slowing down once more to begin descending towards the lunar surface. A new pair of thrusters situated on the vehicle's sidewalls, directly above the primary fuel tanks, will be responsible for Starship's final lunar landing maneuvers. There's a reason why the landing engines on the vehicle are positioned so high up they could be the same hypergolic Draco thrusters that SpaceX employs on the Dragon capsule. Or, they could be something else different. Recall how the Odysseus lander capsized during its attempt to arrive on the moon. Similar to how the Starship Odysseus was tall and narrow, making it prone to toppling, especially on the moon where gravity holds you down much less strongly than it does on Earth yet inertia holds you there anyway. To put it simply, something can be turned over on the moon with around 1 by 4 the energy required to do so on Earth. We are going to be purposefully toppling things over, so this is something to keep in mind. However, putting your control thrusters as close to the vehicle's center of gravity as feasible will result in the best possible stability in the event of a lunar landing, when you do not want your spaceship to come crashing down. Regarding the Starship's interior, we see three main floors with a combined internal space of about 1,000 cubic meters. Our cargo bay, which is situated just above the landing thrusters and houses the ground lift and main door, will have to be at the bottom. The crew will need a lift to go to and from the moon's surface because it is not possible to just jump 50 feet to the ground there. They will also be bringing a lot of equipment and experiments with them for use during their multi-day lunar stopper. This means that it will be kept in storage below, along with the EVA suits and other necessities like water and food oxygen. The rows of windows that appear above the cargo hold are thought to represent the primary crew compartment. This area will be used for daily training and communication between the Starship crew and Earth Command operations during downtime. Next, we may place the crew's sleeping quarters, the space toilet, and the sanitary supplies above that. An airlock and docking port allowing zero-gravity crew transfers from the Orion capsule or gateway station into the Starship in return will be located at the very top of the ship, up in the pointy portion. That's all there is to the Lunar Starship in its landing configuration, which is more than sufficient for the intended purpose of supporting two men for five days on the moon as this part won't be needed at all while on the moon. Perhaps not the best place for a new human lunar outpost to live in the long run, at least not until you start turning everything upside down. Okay, so to start, we need to tip our cargo rocket over onto its side so that we can turn it into a moon base. We'll talk about the reasons behind this after the task is completed. There are a few. Thus, even if tipping a starship on the moon will undoubtedly be simpler, the process will still be difficult. The theory is that because the Earth's gravitational pull, 
is only about 1.62 meters per second square, the ship will be much more vulnerable to sideways influence. This means that if you pull from the very tip of the nose cone to maximize your leverage, you won't need to pull very hard to bring the entire thing down. The amount of traction that can be obtained in the lunar dust, which may be a constraint, may determine whether or not we can simply rig up one or more moon rovers with cables and drag the object over. For your lateral force, you may also employ an electric winch that is anchored into the Earth, a large rock, or the base of another starship. In addition, I've been wondering if a counterweight mechanism is necessary to prevent the ship from simply toppling over and landing on the ground, or if it could manage without one. I doubt that a sudden drop in gravity onto a soft sand-covered ground will cause much damage, but I could be mistaken. The Starship is intended to crash belly first into the Earth's atmosphere at over 26,000 km per hour. In any case, now that it's lying on its side, it's time to begin the restorations. We will therefore be able to utilize the available space within the Starship far more effectively by switching from a vertical to a horizontal layout. However, the process of tearing out the existing interior and putting in a new lengthwise floor plan would be somewhat labor-intensive. To be honest, that's the main issue with this entire concept. Though that sounds amazing in principle, in reality we would be remodeling a house on the moon while wearing spacesuits with very few resources available and a significant risk of tragedy or death. I believe that we simply have to presume that robots will be able to complete tasks for us, and we have faith in the Tesla bot to do so. However, if we can open up the entire 50M length and 9 miles breadth of the Starship body and equip it with everything we require to survive and explore 400,000 miles from home, then we will have an incredible moon base. Theoretically, we want to preserve the most straightforward yet functional interior design that enhances user comfort and convenience. Thus, choosing an open idea makes the most sense, at least in my opinion. We create a level floor from front to back on the Starship's lunar base, which is approximately one-third of the rocket's radius. In this manner, we minimize the impact of claustrophobia on our future moon dwellers by having a good high ceiling and enough of room underneath the floor for equipment and storage. Next, we can divide the ship's length into the different facilities that each person will require. There is a scientific and research lab, a common rack room, a kitchen and mess area, a fitness center, a lavatory and bunk rooms for sleeping. Not elegant, but reasonably cozy. We must now safeguard our moon base since the building period is over. There will be no shortage of meteorites and cosmic radiation every day. About 100 ping-pong ball-sized meteors strike the moon. Because there is no atmosphere to slow them down, these tiny pieces of space rock reach the surface at a speed of 72 kilometers per second. There won't be any wind or rain, so we won't need to seek shelter. They are carrying 3 kilograms of dynamite's worth of kinetic energy. The moon's surface is constantly exposed to cosmic radiation from solar wind exposure because there is no magnetic field to shield it. Although a person wouldn't likely die from this right away, over time it would cause genetic mutations which could result in cancer. A thick covering of regolith or lunar dirt that would envelop the entire starship would be our strongest line of defense against both of these threats. We require a great deal of it. To provide effective protection against cosmic radiation and minor impacts from meteorites, a layer of regolith 5 meters thick is necessary. Regarding significant meteorite strikes, nobody ever promised a safe journey. The Starship's attractiveness now lies in the fact that SpaceX intends to build many more of these to have one rocket launch each day from the factory, and they won't even cost that much to launch. Theoretically, we can place as many Starships on the moon as we choose, and they do not all have to land there carrying humans. Future lunar Starships may arrive with only supplies or robots. The first few will be used for Artemis missions. The possibilities are limitless. For example, we may dock a Starship tanker that is simply filled with water or hydrogen fuel. It's quite absurd to think about, but you can send a Starship to the moon as long as you can fit a piece of infrastructure inside its upper third. It's not all that absurd when you consider that Elon Musk and SpaceX built the Starship specifically to establish a one million person metropolis on Mars. In light of this, it should potentially be very simple to just colonize the moon. It does offer the ideal chance to hone and validate these systems before deploying the entire system to Mars. So would you live in a converted starship on the moon? Leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And hey, if you're feeling adventurous, smash that like button and subscribe for more space adventures.